Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. If you think you're not a malicious person, prove it by hitting the like and subscribe buttons below, it means a lot. And our first story of the day is by Luther Williams. Bank wants to play stupid games? Then let's play stupid games. So I live in South Korea, but I work for a US company in South Korea. And because I work for an American company, and I'm one of the few employees of my company that's American in South Korea, my company doesn't issue me this letter that basically says I'm employed in South Korea. So this means I have restrictions on my Korean bank account. I can only withdraw 250,000 won, about 216 USD a day, from an ATM. And if I go to a person teller, I can only withdraw 1 million won, about $870 a day. This normally doesn't present a problem for me. I also can't have a debit or credit card as I get a bank book, which is kind of like an electronic checkbook that's a physical thing you carry. FYI, I use my American bank for most of my day-to-day -day spending. But it did once. I signed a lease for a new apartment and the deposit was 10 million won, about $8,700. Yes, this is normal for Korea. So I transferred the money from my American bank to my Korean bank and I went to the bank in person to transfer the money to my landlord. I get there and the teller tells me I can only transfer 1 million per day. My first idea was to ask my landlord if she'd be cool with me transferring her 1 million won a day for 10 days. She doesn't like that idea. So I'm sitting there arguing and the bank manager comes out, he's a nice enough man and speaks good English. Basically, he says, because of my type of account, there's no way I can transfer more than 1 million a day. So, I need this money, and I'm thinking, and the light bulb goes off in my head. If I close my account, do I get the money? The manager says, yes, we would give you the cash. I say, and if I close my account, can I open a new one? They say, of course. I ask, is there a waiting period after closing my account to open a new one? And they say, no. So I say, fantastic, please close my account. The manager says, sure, I'll need your bank book and we'll destroy it. I hand them my bank book and they destroy it, sign some papers to close the account. Bank manager closes the account and gives me all the money in the account in an envelope. The manager asks, anything else I can help you with today? I smile, pull out my passport and say, yes, I'd like to open a new bank account. Bank manager looks at me and it dawns on him what I just did he laughs, shakes his head and goes, sure, not a problem. I open a new account, deposit 10,000 won and left with my deposit in my pocket. I believe this qualifies for malicious compliance because I followed the bank's rules and it resulted in them having to do more work. If you were stuck in a tight situation like this and the bank wouldn't let you withdraw all the money you needed, would you be willing to go and close your bank account today, keep the money you need and reopen a new account? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Nightskater97, so I wore the wrong type of underwear in the pool. I, 24 year old male, hosted a friend from college, also 24, that I haven't seen since before the pandemic. Shortly after he arrives, we head to a local bar and grill in our neighborhood. We decided to do the 15 to 20 minute walk instead of drive, so we didn't have to worry about leaving the car. I was joined by my roommate, 25 male, and also a good friend, and his newish girlfriend, 22 who I didn't know that well, but I've always had friendly encounters with when we hung out. At the bar, drinks flowed freely and my friend seemed to really hit it off with our crew. We stayed longer than expected and it was fully dark and we were well buzzed by the time we decided to walk home. It was still hot outside when we got to the apartment complex, so my roommate suggested that we hit the community pool. The pool and hot tub were technically closed for the night, but it isn't too close to any of the units and generally no one cares if you're responsible and don't break glass bottles or anything like that. After debating whether to head back to our place to change first, my roommate insisted that we're all friends here and that we could all just go to the pool in our underwear. Everyone agreed on this, although my roommate's girlfriend announced, you guys have fun with that, and proceeded to lounge next to the pool on one of the deck chairs and scroll Instagram. We stripped down and hop in the pool and were having a pretty good time just messing around. After some time had passed, my roommate was chatting with his girlfriend and then quietly approached me afterwards. Apparently his girlfriend was very uncomfortable with me wearing just briefs in the pool. Both my roommate and my friend were wearing boxer briefs. And she wanted me to go all the way back to the apartment and change into a swimsuit. I initially protested and said it was his idea in the first place and how everyone was in their underwear and none of us cared. And what's the difference? It's not like my underwear is white or see-through or anything like that. 
My roommate asked me to go change for him as a favor so that it didn't turn into an issue between him and her. I was pissed, but I decided to let it go for the time being. When I got back to the apartment, an idea popped into my head when it occurred to me that I still had a swimsuit from when I used to swim on the club team in college. So I put on my speedo and head back out armed with another six pack for the boys and only a t-shirt, towel wrapped around my waist, and flip flops. I get back to the pool, announced I changed into my swimsuit as requested, drop the towel and ditch the tee, and launch into a wicked cannonball into the pool. I can see a wry smile on my roommate's face, but nothing else was said about my choice of attire. We go on in the pool and a few minutes later, she announces that she's tired and is going to bed. We stay out late, including some more beers and laughs in the hot tub, while the girlfriend was asleep at our place. While very clearly OP's roommate and roommate's girlfriend both had very different opinions on OP's attire, OP comes out in a speedo, the friend smiles. The girlfriend recoils and runs back to the apartment. Homies looking out for each other, you know what I mean? Our next story is by Throw It Out Carmen. That's what soap and water are for. A few years ago, I worked as a hostess in a restaurant. We had this chef that was one of the rudest people I've ever come across. I know chefs are known for not being the nicest, but boy did he deserve that cake. This man literally referred to people as R-words, if you will, asked what race applicants were because some work harder than others. Someone once stole an order because a host turned her back. The person literally grabbed the bag it was in and ran right out. Things happen. He literally screamed at all hosts and said we deserve to be fired over an order. First time it even happened. Anyways, as a host, I didn't venture into the kitchen often. I needed to stay up front as much as possible for guests. I would come to where the door meets the kitchen to grab a server if needed. Well, we weren't technically supposed to have gum, but I had coffee, and I was going to chew it then spit it out. My bad, I forgot. I'll own it. When I was walking past the kitchen at one point, he must have spotted me chew. He asks me to come to where he is right outside the kitchen and I meet him there. He says, you have gum? You know the rules. Do you not pay attention or brush your teeth? Laughing and smirking like he's so clever. I say, yeah, I have gum, sorry, I was going to spit it out. He says, don't say sorry, just don't do it, mocking me at the same time. Me going to walk away to spit it out, and he says, no you're not. He puts his hand up to my mouth, like, spit here. Mind you, he hadn't even put his gloves back on after switching them yet. No lie, I swear I was shocked. I say, um, you sure? You can watch me spit in the trash can, isn't that like a health code violation? He mocks me again and crosses his eyes too. That's what soap and water are for, genius. Me thinking to myself that he was such a mean person to everyone, I was just done with it. I already thought about putting in my two weeks anyway, so I salivate as much as I can and full blown spit into his hand. I try to make it as nasty as he is a person. He raises his voice, are you serious, yelling for my direct manager. I look him in the eyes and say, that's what soap and water are for. Then I walk off to my manager. Now, I didn't get fired, thankfully. It was awkward working with him, but my coworkers died when they heard. I did give him the option to watch me spit in the trash and he didn't like it. So, I technically did what he wanted. I'm sorry, but what coworker goes up to another random coworker that has no attachment to them, holds their hand up and goes, spit your gum in my hand. No, 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 don't go to the trash can, don't go anywhere else. Right here, my bare hand. Spit your gum in it. It's like, hold on, bro, I I don't think I'd even be comfortable, no. And our final story of the day is by Renee Becker, caused a stir at an international organization. Decades ago, in the 90s, I worked as an information researcher for a high commissioner in an international organization. I had a junior position and was 26. During the first years, people at the head office started to reach out to me as well for little requests, as I pride myself to be thorough and fast. Someone in the head office took a liking to me, so when a temporary opening at the head office required a process analyst, which I had studied for as well, I was formally requested for secondment. The high commissioner complied, and off I went to a different country. The relationship between the head office and the field offices was strained for various reasons and the red tape was worse than the Byzantine Empire. Now the project wasn't that interesting, record internal processes in HR and point out flaws, and less of a challenge than initially presented, but it gave me a wonderful insight into the workings of the head office. 
who decided what, and where you wanted to go when you wanted an answer or a decision. Before long, the office of the High Commissioner started to direct requests to me if they needed anything from the head office without invoking the dreaded red tape. As a junior, this was a definite boost for my self-confidence. A couple of weeks into my job, another international office called me. They had received guidance from the High Commissioner that if they wanted anything done at head office, they should call me. So in the time that followed, I would regularly receive calls asking me to arrange all sorts of things, which I did. In the meantime, I'm still working on my project. Remember, I'm still a junior. And then it all went pear-shaped. On a Monday morning, I received a call from the policy director of the High Commissioner. There will be a ministerial conference in the town of the head office, but there seems to be some doubt over the hotel arrangements. If they fax me the details, would I be so kind to go to the hotel this afternoon and talk it through with the general manager? Sure. So I take the afternoon off and arrange everything. The next morning, I'm called into the office of my department director, who's furious, and my manager is standing next to him with her arms crossed. I'm not allowed to sit down, and I'm asked where I was yesterday afternoon. Seeing no problems, I tell them about the call and the hotel. The director then tells me, in no uncertain terms, that I'm not allowed to do work for other offices whilst on the payroll for this office. If I am to lift one finger, there would be grave consequences. Furthermore, pay will be deducted for my absence yesterday. I managed to get in that I took an afternoon off and did it in my own time, but they deem it unpaid leave anyway. In comes malicious compliance. Dejected, I sit at my desk, unable to fathom what I did wrong. Later that day I get two calls, one from the high commissioner and one from the other office, and I inform them that by instruction of the director, I've been forbidden to do any tasks not related to my current position please go through the regular channels. You can imagine how both reacted. The red tape in this organization is legendary. I get more calls from even higher ups in both offices, pleading me to bend the rules just a teeny bit. I mean, it is more of a guideline, wouldn't you say? I hold my ground and suggest they need to clear it with my manager or the director and that my hands are tied. The next day, the process repeats. The political director calls concerning the conference. Can I contact translators and go through the flight plan of the high commissioner and staff with the limo company? I say no. They say what? And I repeat my mantra. He gets furious and starts shouting, not at me, but the general incompetence of the head office, with some choice words about the certain directors there. The next morning, my manager's secretary walks into my office. She's nervous and says, Please report to the Secretary General's office immediately. The tone lets me know that something horrible is afoot, so I actually ran there. The Secretary General's secretary greets me with a malicious grin and says, Oh, you've created quite a mess, have you? I still don't know what's going on, but I could see my immediate termination in a not-so-distant future. As I walk in, there's the Secretary General, my director, and my manager. The secretary general is fuming. He explains to me that a formal complaint is being prepared by the high commissioner and the head of the other office over the lack of service from the head office. Whereby, the high commissioner had even hinted that the department was trying to derail a ministerial conference. This is all due to the fact that it had come to their attention that people had been directly instructed not to assist the two offices. Is this true? I say yes, I've been told that I'm not allowed to perform any duties for any other office while on the payroll of this office. With me present, the Secretary General looks at both and asks, which idiot has decided this? The Director states that he decided this based on the information from my manager. The Secretary General tells him, well this morning I've been shouted at by the High Commissioner and the Head of Office from the other office and I don't like being shouted at. He looks at me and tells me, whenever you receive a request from those offices, I want you to execute these with priority and diligently. This overrides your assignment. If there's any discussion, refer to my office. However, you will report to me weekly on the nature of these requests. My office will confirm this in writing. I nod, say thank you, and get out of there. Inside, shouting ensues. The secretary winks at me with a broad smile. A right mess it is. My head's spinning. Part of my work now falls under the direct supervision of the Secretary General. From that time on, to the end of my second mint, I could basically do whatever I wanted. I attended the conference at the personal request of the High Commissioner and did everything that was asked of me. 
I continued to receive calls from the various offices and ran errands for the Secretary General's office. I even went to other countries to have meetings there at the request of these offices. I finished the project ahead of time and became a go-to person for a lot of people, even when I returned to my own office. After I got back to my office, I received an immediate pay raise, new tasks, and a number of wonderful letters of recommendation. The high commissioner and political director had personally asked for them, which helped tremendously when I changed positions years later. Although the high commissioner has long since passed, I still remember him fondly as a man who had your back, no matter how junior or lowly your position. I think at the very core of this story, the best part is the High Commissioner, despite OP being in a lowly position, identified that OP is the person that deserves these opportunities, and sent them on a whirlwind ride that led to much more success for them. So I'm sure for OP, this is a great thing to look back on. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.